welcome everyone to worship at Scarsdale Community Baptist Church. Whether you're joining us online or whether you're here in person, I hope your hearts are lifted today as we sing and as we learn about the gospel and proclaim what Jesus has done for us. Let's begin our service with our call to worship. And he shall judge between the nations, and he shall decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. What a beautiful promise that Isaiah gives us here in Isaiah chapter 2. And with that in mind, let's stand and let's sing with joy in our hearts our hymn of praise number 2, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Gracious and merciful God, you who pour out abundant blessing upon us, we give thanks for all your great works. Your righteousness endures forever. You nourish the faithful. You make justice. You uphold your covenant. Your name is holy. We are your grateful children. As we offer our prayers and songs from the heart, receive our worship as a fragrant offering. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Glory be.
Good morning. I am Mary Ellen Barbieri, I'm the Director of Family Ministries, and the power row has taken to sitting on laps, so they all fit in the same row. I love it. So, Tiffany, they're going to be on your lap soon. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the worship service this morning. If you are a visitor, uh, you can complete the QR code inside your bulletin so that we can let you know about events happening at SCBC. Uh, today is Don and Margaret Kim's final Sunday as our music worship leaders. We'll be hearing more about that later in the service, but please plan to come to the special fellowship hour in their honor immediately after the service today. November 11th through the 13th uh, is our women's retreat at Sandy Cove, Maryland. It'll be a wonderful time of refreshment and fellowship. Uh, if you are interested in coming, please see Doris after the service so that we can make reservations at the Sandy Cove Retreat Center. I am, I know that I'm really looking forward to being back there and because we haven't been during COVID, um, but w we've been going, this is probably our fourth or fifth trip there. And I know that I am really looking forward to being back there and having fellowship with my sisters in Christ from all over the Northeast. There'll be a, a couple of hundred um, other women there and it's just a wonderful time. Yeah. <laughs> Parents and grandparents, have you ever wondered about how to correctly integrate technology into the life of your child? Whether your, ch your children are two or whether they're 12, um, this is an issue that affects us all. But God hasn't left us without wisdom for raising tech-wise kids. So on Saturday, October 15th, our church will be hosting an event that is open to um, all inside the church and outside. Uh, so we will be bringing in a nationally published editor and author from Focus on the Family, um, Adam Holes, who will, be, who will provide a humor and insight as he gives us tips on how to safely introduce techn technology into the life of our children using God's wisdom. We are highlighting international missions this quarter, so I would like to call up Will Fowler uh, to tell you more about our work with our missionaries from afar. Good morning. Thank you, Mary Ellen. Um, I'm Will Fowler. I'm on the, um, I have the privilege of serving on the missions committee for our church. Uh, missions is a critical part of our church, and it's a critical part of our individual spiritual growth. Each quarter, SCBC supports a different mission theme, and this quarter we're emphasizing global missions. The organizations we support financially work in some of the poorest areas of the world to spread hope and the good news of Jesus Christ. This includes our denominations, International Missions Fund, ABC World Missions, as well as uh, several individual missionaries that we support through ABC, including the Reese family serving in the Dominican Republic. At SCBC, we support missions through a separate fund. So please give generously. There's an envelope in your bulletins. Please give generously to the missions fund in addition to your normal support for the church operations. And now we have a short video highlighting some of the work supported by ABC World Missions. Thank you. Hello and warm greetings in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Sharon Coe and I'm the Executive Director and CEO of International Ministries. In 2022, I am is celebrating our 208th anniversary. That means for over 200 years, God has been working in us and through us to accomplish God's mission. I am has had the great privilege of participating, of playing a small but essential role in that mission. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, I Am Global Servants have been working for about 100 years to meet the needs of the whole person, even as they come alongside their Congolese neighbors and invite them to become disciples of Jesus Christ. I Am Global Servants, Wayne and Catherine Niles, and Tim and Kathy Rice continue this legacy that they have inherited from those that came before them to work at the hospital, provide clean water, teach children, and frankly meet whatever needs their neighbors bring before them. In Bolivia, I am Global Servants JD and Rhonda Reed and Sarah Matos work in partnership alongside their friends Carmen and Richard to bring medical and dental clinics and teaching to children. JD also works online through the MTS, the Masters of Theological Studies program, in which friends, when you give, you are contributing to the teaching and the training 
of leaders and ministers all over Latin America. Friends, I believe that you too have an essential part to play in God's mission in your church, in your neighborhood, and around the world. Please let me invite you to give generously to the World Mission Offering. When you do, you are giving to support these global servants at work around the world. Thank you for your generosity, and may God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Don. Good morning, Margaret. <laughs> Someone once said, the secret of life, the secret, is to listen more to music and less than advice to other people. Now, you may agree or disagree, but it is universally known that music floods our soul it heals our mind, and it gives us an awareness of our creator like no other medium. Music is a miracle. King David knew that. <laughs> he knew that the gift of music was born from the very depths of God's heart. So you might say our Heavenly Father takes a special delight in blessing those who use music to genuinely praise him. And I don't mean just soloists, but all of us when we sing like that first beautiful hymn. It's also been said oftentimes that goodness comes in pairs. Personally, I can think of no other couple who have been more in touch with what it means to please God through his miracle of music than Margaret and Don Kim. Their mutual dedication and service to the Lord and their partnership has been inspirational to countless believers as well as those unchurched for many, many years. Margaret, your high level of selflessness and continuing search for musical and artistic perfection is matched only by your godly devotion. You radiate the Spirit of God with every note that you play. Don, your great vocal skills and your leadership as you sing from a loving and a giving heart is profoundly deep as it is thrilling. And Don, can I tell them? Can I tell them a secret? <laughs> Don has often said to me, he wishes he was born an operatic bass instead of a dramatic tenor, but <laughs> either that or maybe uh, a school of fish, no? <laughs> Above all though, and this is for both of you, your life's experience and your artistic grace and your competence have been and continue to be a blessing. You've taken God's miracle of music, you've given it back to him, and have taken us with you on a beautiful and joyous journey. The words of this familiar hymn are especially for you, Margaret and Don, in whatever the Lord has in store, because I guarantee he's not finished with you by any means. I'm pressing on the upward way, New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found, Lord, you know the words, plant my feet on higher ground. May God continue to bless you both. We love you. Thank you, Stephen, for those eloquent words. 
Um, I would like to give honor to God, who is the head of my life, for without him I can do nothing. I was asked to say a few words about the Kims, but it's hard to put 10 years into two minutes, so pastor, you might be a little disappointed. <laughs> the word of God instructs us in Romans to give honor to whom honor is due. Today I would like to honor Don and Margaret Kim as we remember their life and ministry here at SCBC and as they transition into retirement. I arrived at this church some months before the Kims started their ministry here, about 10 years ago. But their ministry started long before they came to SCBC. The Lord called Mrs. Kim as a young girl to play the piano in her church growing up. And she has continued to play the piano and organ in ministry with her husband wherever the Lord has led them. And about 10 years ago, the Lord led them here to our fellowship. I remember just speaking with Pastor Mark in the days following their arrival. And he observed that they brought a different spirit, he said, to our worship. And they did, they brought the Holy Spirit. I can truly say that Margaret and Don changed the direction of our worship upward. The focus of their ministry has been on glorifying the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I would like to thank them for their leadership in reminding us of the majesty and holiness of the God we serve. As I thought back on their time here, I remembered one of their discoveries in SCBC, the bells, which were long forgotten in the corner of the church for years and maybe even decades. Needless to say, after the Bell's refurbishment, the Bell Choir was started, which was just an addition to the other many choirs they were already instructing. Their ministry here included the development of the Chancel Choir, Youth Choir, Bell Choir, the Little Orchestra, in addition to mentoring various church members in their instruments of choice for solos during worship service. Special services such as Music Sunday during Advent, Good Friday service, and Easter service featuring the SCBC Ensemble were very special times of year, presenting sacred and contemporary music. So much love and sacrifice were poured into these preparations for these services. But even during the off season, they have worked endlessly to make every Sunday a special sacrifice of worship. Margaret has spent hours a day practicing the organ in preparation for Sunday service. And every Sunday morning during choir rehearsal, Don would never fail to quote from the Psalms and encourage the choir members to praise the Lord in sincerity and with a joyful heart. I would like to say thank you to the Kims for the hard work, time, and encouragement you provided in identifying and developing the gifts in others in the congregation, both young and mature, and allowing us to partner with you in ministry. But aside from their ministry, what is truly remarkable are the lives of Don and Margaret, the, the lives they conduct. They are a beautiful couple that walk in humility, who love God and love the people of God. I believe nothing is more important for a Christian leader and servant. Thank you, Don and Margaret, for this example. Don, <clears throat> thank you for your humor during choir practices, your tender heart, your encouragement, and thank you for that full singing voice that we all aspire to have. Margaret, thank you for your love and patience, especially with the children, for allowing the organ to come alive with praise through your fingers, and for your fervent prayer life as demonstrated to your, during your frequent fellowship at Wednesday night prayer group. May the Lord bless your retirement just as he has blessed your long and fruitful career with his presence, his purpose, and his power. Though you have retired from SCBC, your ministry to the body of Christ is long from over. God has a purpose for your retirement. Continue to rely on him to lead you through this new phase in life. Thank you for sharing your gifts and your lives with us at SCBC. We love you, we appreciate you, and you will always be part of the SCBC family. Mr. and Mrs. Kim, thank you for creating the Bell Choir. Through the Bell Choir, we were able to bond with our brothers and sisters in Christ after service to perfect our pieces. And even if they weren't perfect, you still encouraged us to make a joyful noise. My brother and I also enjoyed being given the opportunity to play our instruments in front of the church. It helped us improve our playing and praise God with the gifts he has given us. Thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Kim, for all your sacrifice and dedication in blessing this church. 
You will be missed very dearly. And we would just like to present these gifts to you from the music committee as well as from us. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Fabrina. Thank you, Don and Margaret, Kim. Your love for each other honors Jesus and exemplifies the gospel in amazing ways. And the words that Stephen and Fabrina wrote are far more eloquent than any prayer I can put together, uh, but let me try. And so let's, let's bow our heads together as we pray to our Heavenly Father. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for he is good, and sing his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, his people for his own possession. Lord, as we pray sections of the psalm each week, we are re reminded of how good and glorious it is to sing your name. And with this in mind, Lord, I thank you for Don and Margaret Kim who have embodied the call to sing your name with joy. Jesus, they are your faithful servants, and we pray your blessing on them today. Give them an abiding sense of your hand on their life, and give us a spirit of celebration and thanksgiving for their ministry. Jesus, I also pray for our singing life together and our worship. Lord, that we might proclaim the truth of your gospel with every song that we sing. And secondly, Lord, that our affections might be moved towards you and towards each other as we sing your praises together. Give us confident assurance of your grace and give us confident assurance, Heavenly Father, that you have made us into a spiritual family. May we delight in our unity together through Jesus Christ as we sing his praises. For our students, Lord, who feel like the beginning of school was months ago, Jesus, you sympathize with, sympathize with every one of our students' needs. And so we ask you, calm their anxiety during tests. Give them diligence and hard work to study. Give them keen recall, Lord, but also help them see you. May they be reminded that what ultimately defines them is your grace. Lord, I also lift up to you, to you today the marriages in our community. Father, before you established even any of the institutes of religion, you established marriage as a reflection of who you are. Diversity being brought together in harmonious unity, creating life and flourishing. But struggle is normal in marriage, and we live east of Eden. And so for those marriages, Lord, that are struggling, strengthen them, guide them, and even give them, give them the courage to ask for help from their brothers and sisters in Christ when they are in need, Lord. Give them grace for each other and for themselves. And even for those marriages that's, that are thriving right now, Lord. From glory to glory, Lord, lead them further up and further in to the image of God that is revealed in marriage. Sovereign Lord, the one in whom we move and live and have our being, we are your children and we trust the goodness of your providence in our life. Give us trust that your grace is sufficient and give us joy in your presence. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So with joy in our hearts, let's stand and sing hymn number 369, Jesus, I Have Promised.
You may be seated. So we are a community of grace, and I was just reminded that I was moved in the spirit, and I missed two really important parts of our worship service. So at this point in time, I want to invite up Don Kim to give his thank you. And my many apologies, Don. I got so caught up in the spirit, I wanted to pray. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. I know he has. I don't know whether you know him. <laughs> but how much time do I have? As much as you need, Don. Mrs. Kim, she is known as my former fiance. I don't know whether some of you know. <laughs> Say after me, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God doesn't have a hearing problem. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, we used to do, do this before pandemic, right? Some people said we were out of control. Oh, she's over there. <laughs> anyway, don't do that to me. <laughs> anyway, today is a day of celebration. As the Bible says, we will rejoice not only today, every day of rest of our lives, right? Yes. Now, we are ending our job here. I don't think I served because I got paid. I performed my duty. Now, I have to catch up with your favorite and my favorite, Moses. He started his ministry when he was 80 years old. Some of you know that, right? Um, I'm 82 years old, and he has to catch up with me. <laughs> so I have uh, 38 more years to go until I reach 120 years old. Correct? Did you hear me? Yes. Some of you say, well, I'm a born-again Christian, but making a confidential. Now we have to rejoice and shout to the Lord, right? Amen. Just like a King David. And Steve and Fabrina, you are undeserved, uh, as you say, comments on us is overwhelming. And some of you may not know, SBC Music Ministry was done by Napier family and Swain family. Without them, we would have a no music ministry. Some of you may not know. And where's Brian Napier? And Chandra. They were the real backbone of the church. I thank them. Also, Eric Faraji, without his playing drum, I don't think he went to law school. I think he was practicing drum 24-7. <laughs> but there are so many people I want to thank you. But most of all, I thank my Lord. Amen. 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 He took the chain of my neck and gave me you heart, heart of flesh, and he cleansed my lips so I can praise him. And the Bible says, these people I made for myself. In King James, says, thou shall show forth my praise. I don't think I gave him my praise, but he gave his praise to me, and I was returning back to him. Because our lips were too dirty. But that's what Jesus did. He took the chain off my neck and cleansed my lips with his blood on the cross. Now, I have been here for almost 10 years by the God's grace and because of his provision. And he allowed us to be part of his music ministry despite 
uh, inadequacy and shortcomings. Some of you had to put up with us for the last 10 years, and I feel so, I just feel sorry for you. <laughs> Did you know Danny and I are very close friends because he's a Polish. I have a lot of heart for Polish people, special, special heart. And he will someday advocate for Koreans, right? Yes. Anyway, I thank God for Pastor Mark. Pastor Richard Berg, Pastor Dan Hintz. They withstood and helped us to carry on our job. And I thank you. Give him a big, big hand. Round of applause. <laughs> also, you shouldn't forget Tiffany Hintz. She volunteered to sing. I was dying to hear her singing, and she did a wonderful job. Oh, I thank you for it. Uh, but we have uh, many ways to go until we all shout and claim our rightful place for the kingdom. If you don't, the God will say, the rocks will cry out. The trees will clap their hands. We don't want to lose that, our privilege and the right to the nature. Do you agree? Amen. So now, well, I don't have the fancy oratory of the words, but I sometimes talk off my head. I don't have written script. So I may start mumbling in Korean, you may say there's a tongue. <laughs> so I thank you all. If I have offended any of you by words, by action, by inaction, please forgive me. I want to make clear that I have a no ill feeling and leave any unspoken, unforgiven hearts behind me. So please forgive me. And once you've forgiven, God said, don't remind me, I even have forgotten. God has a short memory. Did you know that? Now God has a short memory. So once you forgive me, God will say, I have forgotten. That's the gospel. And I thank you. God bless you. And I miss this, this girls, uh, the, the, the kids in the front. They are my grandchildren. <laughs> Whenever they sing doxology and recite the Lord's Prayer, I hear them. Yeah. And my Gloria party, and my heart is all filled with the joy. They are the future for the church. I would not miss any of you, but I'll miss them. <laughs> That's the true, honest God, true. And I told each one, each, every one of them that with my big hug, you are my favorite. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> but they realized I was lying to everybody. <laughs> but I'll miss them. And I even tell, show the pictures of the people. They, they are my grandchildren. They really believe it because I became a Jamaican. I did. I love Jamaican. Anyway, I, I talk too long until uh, you stop me, but uh, I'll have Mark to say something. Well, nothing more to say. My husband did a great job. <laughs> yeah, really. But do you remember he taught you hallelujah? You remember that, right? Yeah, because the Yah is the Yahweh, our God. So you never sing hallelujah. You don't do that. Hallelujah. That's what Don did all the time, right? Okay, now since already said, you know, just a wonderful, uh, just a, yeah, um, parting remarks, whatever. 
but I just want to share just this one Bible verse, and then that'll uh, yeah do my uh, yeah okay my last word for you. This is from Zephaniah three seventeen. It says, "The Lord your God is in our midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over us with gladness." He will renew, you, renew us in his love. He will exult over us with loud singing as on a day of a festival. So from now on, you are going to sing really, really with all your hearts, all right? Because our Father is singing with a loud voice because he loves us so much. So we are going to, in turn, we are going to sing all these hymns so loud with all our hearts. Promise? Right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So we're at the point in the service we're improvising a little bit right now. So let's hear two readings back to back. And so let's hear from our first Bible reading. Thank you. a little to the left. I'll be right there for you. This is Psalm 2, verses 7 through 12. I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, with trembling. Kiss his feet or he will be angry, and you will perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Happy are all who take refuge in him. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Today we'll be reading, the second reading is from Matthew 26. It's on page 33 of your pew Bible, and it's from 59 to 68. Oh, sorry, page 31 of your pew Bible. Now the chief priest and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death but they found none though many false witnesses came forward at least at last two came forward and said this fellow said I am I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days the high priest stood up and said have you no answer what is it that they testify against you but Jesus was silent then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said unto him, you have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has blasphemed. Why do we still need witnesses? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? They answered, he deserves to die. He deserves death. Then they spat on his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, prophecy, prophecy to us, you, you Messiah. Who is it that struck you? May God add a blessing to the reading of his word.
today was the wrong day to write a 60-minute sermon. So today we are getting into Matthew, Matthew chapter 26, and this is where we see boldly the betrayal of our Messiah, or the betrayal of Jesus. And as we get into this sermon, I want to deal with a word that we don't often deal with, which is allegiance or loyalty. We don't live in a world anymore where allegiance, loyalty, or even obligation are categories that we necessarily always think in. And as a millennial, I still remember days in kindergarten and elementary school, even in the middle school, where I had to put my hand over my heart at the beginning of the school year, uh, at the school day every single day, and say the pledge to allegiance. And the reason I was instructed to do that by my teachers and my principal wasn't because that's just what nice people do. It was because it was believed that citizens actually had a moral obligation to their country. And I'm not trying to be nationalistic as I begin our conversation today. I just want to tip my hat to the fact that this has been a lived reality in most countries for most of history. And we actually saw this written large over, our, over the newspapers this week. Any of us who are able to see or to tune in to uh, the funeral service for the Queen of England, like you saw allegiance written large over English history. Like people queued for, my goodness, 14 hours to be able to pay their respects. And the reason they did it wasn't because that's just what nice people do. The reason they did it wasn't because that's just what polite people do. The reason they did it is because they felt they had an obligation to their sovereign to do such things. And I find it so interesting as, as people were being interviewed during the, uh, like about their experience at the funeral, they never once actually experienced that outside obligation as something that was somehow oppressive to them or that misshaped their, their identity. Actually, quite the opposite. They identified with it deeply. They felt like it, it made them into a better kind of people. But we don't live in a world where words like allegiance or obligations are categories that we normally think in. After all, we are fiercely independent people. We are fiercely independent-minded. And we don't like other people putting moral obligations on us from the outside. In fact, it's very rare when that's okay I can say this, that it's okay in one instance for sure. My daughter, who's about two years old right now, like, I will teach her that she has a moral obligation to be a fan of the Green Bay Packers. Like, she just doesn't have any other option. Like, it's, it's, it's necessary to be a part of my family. But I, I think all of us, like, we, we, we struggle at times with this, this word called allegiance and the reality that we, we might actually have a moral obligation to something outside of us. We're so fiercely independent. Like we're so, like our priority is so inwardly directed at times that the categories we think in can defy most of history. And so today I want to challenge you. I want us to think cross-culturally. I want us to look at history and just to assume for a second that our spiritual and our historical forebearers we're actually tuning into something important that we have forgotten, namely allegiance. That allegiance to something outside of ourself is something that is good and it shapes the human person and it might even shape the human soul into uh, like a, a greater and a deeper humanity. In fact, I would say that we cannot understand Matthew 26. I would even say that we can't understand the betrayal of Jesus until we understand this category of allegiance or loyalty. And so my sermon is going to take place in three different parts. If you're a note taker, you can write down these headings. Part one is this, owed allegiance. Part two is failed allegiance. And then part three is faithful allegiance. And those first two parts, owed allegiance and failed allegiance, are all about us. And the final part, as we land the plane, is going to be about Jesus and the fact that he is the one who is truly allegiant to the Father and expressing his love to us. But let's just like, jump in to the tragedy of Matthew chapter 26. I want to say that we can't understand Matthew chapter 26 without understanding this reality, that the Bible believes that 
there is someone, namely the Messiah, who all the world is expected to show allegiance to. And just like, a jog through the Old Testament can lead us there. And we had a reading out of Psalm 2, which is a messianic psalm, which is about the world needing to pay allegiance to the Messiah. And it concludes, blessed are all who take refuge in him. And that's not just the Psalms. Look at Isaiah. For instance, Isaiah 9 promises that Emmanuel is going to be the Prince of Peace, God with us. If you flash before that to Isaiah 2, where you, uh, Isaiah actually spells out what that looks like, you see everyone beating their swords into plowshares. A nation no longer goes to war with other nations. Right? This divine agent of justice, this Messiah, is the one to whom all the world owes allegiance, and gladly so he brings peace. This is the one who in Psalm 96 the rivers and the rocks and the seas, they clap their hands for joy because the generous and just God is coming to actually judge the world through the Messiah. And again, all the world, even the natural world, owes this person their allegiance. We see this writ large over the entire New Testament, and Matthew doesn't pull any punches. In Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, lest we forget how this gospel begins, it says the genealogy of Jesus Christ who is Jesus Christ? And what is that, does that word mean? It means king. Right? Christ isn't the last name of Jesus. It wasn't Mary Christ and Joseph Christ. It's simply Jesus Christ. He's the king of all kings. And he is the one to whom all of us rightly owe our allegiance. And again, in America today, we have a hard time wrestling with categories like this. But I want to say that despite the fact that we don't think in terms of allegiance, I really want to press you today in your thinking. I think oftentimes where we may think individualistically, like we're rugged individualistic thinkers, I think very often we behave in a very different way. Let me spell this out in terms of history. If you read history, you'll find that, that people just had this sense in their heart that there is an idea of a leader out there that can rightly claim our allegiance. Let me give you just two ancient examples very quickly. In Mesopotamia, you have the, the epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is a, a, a fantastic, great, divinely appointed leader who had the character and ability to bring justice in a way that otherwise no one else could bring justice. He was the one that everyone hoped might come one day who could do for the country or do for the nation what they could not collectively do for themselves. Flash forward a little bit of time in history to the Odyssey. The Odyssey, for those of you who don't know, was like the Bible of the Greco-Roman world. It was one of the most quoted documents in, in, in Greco-Roman history. And like the main character of the Odyssey is Odysseus. He's a, a, a man, he's a king of great character who had courage and wisdom and valor. And he was the one that the ancient world just longed for. If, if only someone like Odysseus could come, then he could take us where none of us would be able to go. And if he was to show up, he, was, he would be the one who we, we would naturally give our allegiance to. Right? This, this notion of allegiance is written all over the ancient world. It was assumed. And so oftentimes, as modern readers... We read the ancients and we think, oh, those silly a ancients who just were, were way too, like, they just longed too much for a leader to lead them someplace that they couldn't go themselves. And here's where I really want to press us in our, uh, in our current dialogue. I, I think we might think in terms that go against allegiance, but the way we behave, I think, thoroughly embrace this historic worldview. There's a longing in all of our hearts for someone to give our true allegiance to. Let me just say point and fact. Every four years, there is a presidential election. And don't worry, I'm not going to say anything stupid right now. <laughs> but every four years, there is a presidential election. And parties, people on both sides, both parties whip themselves up into a frenzy. I, if, if only we could just get our person into office, he or she. If only we can just have that one leader in office. And if only they were good enough Man, they could take our country in a direction that I couldn't direct it or that no one else could direct it. And we just, we just long for this person. If only the right person was in the executive branch and they were, they were of the right character, right, and of the right metal, 
and they were making the right decisions, that person I, I would give my allegiance to. I think every four years, we see this written large over the modern heart or the postmodern heart. We still have this deep-seated longing to give our allegiance to a true leader. And this is written large. I think once you see it, you just can't help but to see it. This is written large over every organization. Consider most megachurches in America today, which are especially susceptible to the cults of personality. Why is it that megachurches time and time again fall, fall prey to the cult of personality? Because they, they look at the world around them and it's dark and it's scary. And the church seems to be in decline. And if only we could find that one person who could just muster the rhetoric. Who could just make us laugh enough. Who could grow the church. Who could make us feel influential. Then we would give our full allegiance to that person. And it's been a disaster in many ways. And it's not even just the church. Consider your favorite sports franchise. Any of us, any of you who like Barcelona, like when, when is the next Messi going to arrive and who is going to replace him? For those of you who are Tampa Bay Buccaneer fans, like when is Tom Brady going to retire and wh what, how are we going to replace him? Like we, we see this idea of a great leader, I think, written large over all of our life. Even, I think, subconsciously, we can poke at this a little bit. I, I think this, this intuition in all of us, this hope for a leader that we could give our allegiance to, I think it's one of the reasons why marriages at times can fail. Because when we marry that, that other that we have, when we marry our spouse, we have this hope in our heart. Maybe, just maybe, they're, they're, they're the person who can take my life in a direction I didn't see. Ma maybe, just maybe, they, they are the person who can take my my life in a direction that I've always dreamed of, but I've never been able to accomplish for myself. And what, what happens when we realize that our spouse is just as small-minded and backward as we are? Suddenly we're crushed with the disillusion. Why? Because we had this hope that they would be this, this leader that would take us someplace that we couldn't get ourselves, that would give us the family that we always wanted, or give us the career or the home or the vacations that we've always wanted. And if they could be that person of upstanding character, then we would give them our full allegiance. And the moment we realize that's not true, everything seems to be crumbling around us. I think this is written deeply into all of our modern hearts. Right? This desire for someone to take us where we can. Now I want you to ask yourself a question. Why on earth can this, this intuition, this hope, why can it be written throughout all times, throughout all cultures, throughout all eras of history? In my mind, this is something given to us by God. It's the fingerprint of God on our heart pointing us toward someone. And if you're a skeptic, whether you're watching online or whether you're here today, if you're a skeptic and you're wondering, I don't know if I quite believe that, let me tell you this. Like, what is going to prevent you from falling in to misplacing your allegiance? Because this can be very easily manipulated. Why on earth every four years do our, our politicians give us some of the highest rhetoric possible? Because they're trying to key into that. What is going to prevent you from having someone else manipulate this hope in your heart? If you're a Christian, if you believe the Bible, there are firm answers for that. But if you're not, you seem to be on unsolid ground sometimes. I want to challenge you there. But I, I, I want to begin this first point simply by pointing to this reality. That we don't think in terms of categories of allegiance, but in fact it's written deeply in our hearts. And I think this is actually pointing us toward Jesus. And I think this is why Matthew begins his gospel the way he does in Matthew 1.1. 1, 1, the genealogy of Jesus, the king, the one in whom we rightly owe our allegiance. Well, I just ask ourselves the question as the gospel of Matthew unfolds, especially now as we're in uh, chapter 26. We might owe Jesus allegiance, but how do we actually treat him? And this brings us to our second point, which is failed allegiance. In Matthew 26, we see everyone abandon Jesus. All categories, all types of people. Let me just give you a couple of different highlights. In verse 3 of Matthew 26, the spiritual leaders of Israel plot his death. In, verses, in verse 14 through 16, Judas sells 
Jesus for 30 silver coins. In verse 40, Peter, James, and John are found sleeping. In verse 56, all the disciples flee Jesus. In verses 69 through 75, the cl- one of the closest friends of Jesus, namely Peter, flees Jesus. Like, why does Matthew seem to heap up betrayal upon betrayal upon betrayal? And it doesn't matter who you are, outsider, insider, young, old, powerful, powerless. It seems as, as, as if all people abandon and betray Jesus. And I think Matthew's painting a picture that we're supposed to see ourselves in. None of us are as guiltless as we want to think. All of us. Our disciples, just like Jesus' disciples, and all of us have turned our back on Jesus. And in my mind, I think one of the questions that Matthew 26 asks us is why? Like, w- why is it that despite our best intentions, we inevitably betray the one we owe our allegiance to? And I think Matthew gives us two points here. The first point is that we overestimate our own strength of character. And the second point is that we underestimate our own propensity for sin. So let's just let's look at Peter, for example, as a, a perfect picture of this. Read with me in Matthew 26, verses 35. And here, Peter has this profound, wonderful promise that he speaks to Jesus. In Matthew 26, 35, this is what he says. And Peter said to Jesus, Even if I must die with you, I, or so even, yeah, I will not deny you. And all the disciples agreed. Yeah, Peter, we agree with you. Yeah, we're all, we're all going to die with you, Jesus. We are in this to win this. We are at your back. Peter thinks he's a lion when exactly, in, when in fact the opposite proves to be true. He's more like a, a house cat. Let's, let's look at verse 69 for a second of Matthew 26. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came up to him. Now, here's here's what we know from the grammar of the Greek and also the culture that Matthew's speaking in. We know this servant girl is probably no younger than age six or seven and probably no older than age 13, let's say. And Peter is terrified of her. So let's let's just do a practical application right now. So we have Liana Napier, who is 13 or 14 years old right now. So whom among us if we bumped into Liana Napier, would be so terrified that we would betray our Lord and Savior to his very death. Like, Liana's tough, take it for granted. But I I don't think any of us would be so intimidated that we would betray Jesus over over her. Peter bumps into Liana Napier, and three times he denies his Lord and Savior he, not, he completely overestimates his own courage. And I, I think, as much as we want to laugh at Peter sometimes, like we do the same things. Like I, I don't know about you, but for me, at least every new year, I make all these grand, amazing promises for my Lord and Savior. Jesus, I'm going to wake, wake up at 5 a.m. every day. You can count on me, and I'm, I'm going to do my devotionals, and I'm going to pray rain or shine, cold or warm, Five o'clock every morning, I'm going to be up, Jesus. And January 2nd rolls around, and I wake up, and that bed is really warm. <laughs> and I, I, don't, I don't necessarily want to do it. I think it's so easy to make these grand, amazing promises to Jesus. Have any of us uh, ever watched the movie The Bodyguard? 1992, it's a fantastic movie. I love that movie. But Whitney Houston had a smash hit that same year, and it's, and I will always love you. All of you are going to YouTube it when you go home. I know you will. It's a wonderful song. And I, I think so often in church, especially, now I, I want to couch my words here, especially as we sing some modern hymns. Some modern hymns are just obsessed with how wonderful our love for God is. And we love to praise God for how much we love him. And I think in many ways, when we have a regular diet of simply modern hymns, what we do is we whip ourselves up into this frenzy where we think the core of our faith is actually our own ability to love God. And so what do we do? We make these grand promises to God. God, I will always love you. One of the things I love about the older hymns is that it has such wisdom. I mean, it's just, just consider the hymn that we sang, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. At the center of it is this line 
that's so humbling. But they, they, they understood, those who wrote such hymns understood the human heart so much better than we do. Come thou fount of every blessing. At the center of it says this. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thine courts above. The only thing our spiritual forebearers were confident of was our own ability to wander away from God and God's ability to find us. And this leads us to our last point, that our faith isn't about us, isn't it? We owe Jesus our full allegiance and we continually fail to give Jesus our full allegiance, but that's not the point. The gospel is all about Jesus' faithfulness to us. And so this leads me to point three, faithful allegiance. Time after time, since Matthew chapter 16, Jesus has been predicting his own death and the reality that he's going to be betrayed and killed. And Jesus, in predicting his death, speaks in ways that his disciples simply have like no categories for and they 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 can't seem to understand it and so on his final night with them when he's finally trying to get through to them i find it amazing that when jesus is trying to explain the meaning of his death like he doesn't write a systematic theology like if i was in the shoes of jesus i would have written like a thousand page systematic theology on atonement and no one would have read it <laughs> But Jesus, he does something, ama he gives us something as simple as a meal. And it's so relatable and it's so incarnational that even the youngest among us can begin to understand it. And there's two very simple parts to this meal as he wants to explain his own faithfulness to his followers. It's the bread and it's the cup. Jesus takes his followers and he says, this is my body broken for you. And that prepositional phrase is like the heart of the gospel. Who is Jesus for? He is for you. And I think it's amazing. He begins with an individualistic call there. As he breaks the bread, he says, this is my body for you. In, in other words, as individuals, all of us, like we have to wrestle with the fact that we are not the individuals that God has created us to be. And I say this time and time again, but not only do we not live up to God's standards, like we don't live up to our own standards most of the, to most of the time. And we have to wrestle with our own moral fail failure. And we have to wrestle with the fact that Jesus had to be broken so that we could be invited to the table. As Baptists, historically, this is the reason, one of the reasons why we don't allow children or non-believers to take the communion meal with us. Because those who take the communion meal have to reckon with the fact that the only reason they're invited is because Jesus' body has been broken, and because of that, we have his forgiveness. Until you wrestle with that, you, you are not emotionally or intellectually prepared to sit at the table with Jesus. But Jesus doesn't leave it at an individual call, does he? He then goes on to the cup, and then he says, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out, now catch the prepositional phrase, for the many. When we sit down at the table, we begin with ourselves. This is my body broken for you, but we transition to the many. Meaning that when we sit at table with Jesus, not only are we at the table with Jesus, we are at with people who speak a different language and think different thoughts and vote for different people, and have all sorts of different ideas about the world. And the beauty of the communion table is that it levels the playing field. None of us are more sinners than anyone else, which means that none of us should have a facade of false humility, and at the same exact time, none of us should have pride, because none of us are less redeemed than anyone else. And at the heart of Jesus' sacrifice is this notion of me for you. Jesus leverages everything he has for us. And I think this is a beautiful word of hope to us. If any of us are struggling with our own lack of enthusiasm for God, if any of us are fearful that God might be angry at us because of our own lack of commitment, 
If any of us are worried that God might abandon us because he's frustrated by our own inability to clean up our life, maybe we're stumbling into a sin time and time and time again and we can't seem to get over it. Here is the good news of the gospel. Take heart. as Jesus is faithful. He is the one who we owe allegiance to and he is the one who we we continually um, forget to give our allegiance to. But that doesn't matter because that's not the gospel. The gospel tells us of Jesus' allegiance to us. And the beauty of the Bible is it promises us this, that the good work that God has began in you, he will see it through even if he has to carry us over the finish line. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we are so thankful that you are faithful to us, that you are for us, that you've given yourself for us, Lord, and that because of that, you will never leave us or forsake us. Where hearts are cold, may that kindle a spark of warmth in us, Lord, and where hearts are discouraged, may they see you, may we see you, Lord, the author and perfecter of our faith, Lord, and may that fill us with joy. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Uh, So we have an opportunity now as a church to continue our time of worship by offering our tithes and offerings. If you are brand new and checking out this church for the first time, please don't feel obligated to give. Consider this service our gift to you. But if SEBC is your church home, I invite you to give generously for the expanse of the gospel. Thank you. Uh, This offertory was... One of my favorite songs since when I was in grammar school. We sang this throughout our lives, especially in Korea, everybody sings this. And uh, this song was chosen by none other than Margaret and Pastor Dan, and I could not negotiate. (laughs) So consider this is my last encore I have been postponing called as the proverb says hope deferred makes your heart sick but when it's realized the tree of life so you will have a tree of life when I sing this song God bless you
And Jesus, we thank you for these generous offerings. Lord, you give us the ability to produce wealth for ourselves, Lord. And you also invite us to be generous. I thank you, Lord, that these tithes and offerings are the fruit of your work in us. Please use them and multiply them for your gospel and for your glory. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, remain standing as we sing our final hymn, hymn number 51, Guide Me, O Great Jehovah. Here is my benediction for you today. May a song be in your mouth, may joy be in your hearts, and may Jesus lead you all the way. I pray that's true of you this week. Go, be blessed, and have a wonderful Sunday. Amen.